Good afternoon. I'm David Mandy, president of O&M Partners. Um, I want to welcome you today to the Seabridge Gold Town Hall call. Um, Seabridge trades under the symbol SA on the New York Stock Exchange and also has a symbol on the TSX. The symbol is SEA. Uh, for those of, the, of you that are new to these broadcasts, this event is brought to you by uh, New York-based O&M Partners. Uh, we're a mark marketing and communications company. Uh, we're not a broker dealer. We are not commissioned. We are focused simply on bringing managements of public companies and non-deal investors together in real time. Um, we all the information presented today is is uh, is public. We are hoping by providing context um, and giving you the information in such a way that to provide immediacy um, that you'll be able to inform. Um, make a better informed investment decision. We want to answer everyone's questions on this call, so please feel free to chat in your questions uh, through the uh, go to go to webinar uh, pane or you can just email us. Um, we'll while we have time for only a certain number of questions, be assured that we'll get back to you after the call um, if we don't get back to you during the call. Uh, before we turn to our host, Rudy Frank, um, we'd like to uh, begin with uh, an introduction by uh, Trevor Hall uh, to the mining industry, to the, um, what's going on today the, with the, the COVID-19 virus, and just kind of helping us with context of in this investment climate. Uh, uh, Trevor Hall is the host, uh, producer of the Mining Stock Daily, um, a daily podcast on uh, junior exploration mining, precious metals. Uh, the Mining Stock Daily is published every weekday morning prior to the market open. Uh, Trevor uh, Hall is also the president of Clear Creek Digital. The agency specializes on social media management and um, new media production. So on that note, we'll turn the call over to Trevor and then we'll turn to Rudy Frank. Good day, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Trevor Hall. I am the producer and host of Mining Stock Daily. Uh, we'll get into Mining Stock Daily just a little bit, but today I'm just providing a uh, kind of a brief overview of how COVID-19 is really affecting uh, mining and mineral exploration. Uh, this is going to be kind of a 30,000 square or 30,000 uh, foot view from the top, not going into every single project or jurisdiction, but uh, obviously it's having a big impact um, on the industry. Uh, so we're going to get into that here. Uh, I just briefly wanted to introduce you to Mining Stock Daily. Uh, we are a daily uh, news briefing and podcast with some commentary on markets. Uh, sometimes we produce anywhere from two to four pieces each day, um, intraday market commentary, corporate interviews, executive interviews, and then also some post-market commentary. The bread and butter really is pre-market uh, news briefings uh, from mineral exploration uh, headlines out of the day. We typically produce uh, this news briefing uh, each morning, trading morning, about an hour before the market opens. Um, so it's usually about, it's a briefing, so usually about seven to nine minutes in total. Uh, we do distribute on about a dozen different networks throughout the world. Um, you can find it anywhere you get your favorite podcasts, anywhere from Apple Podcasts and iTunes to Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts. Uh, we are also on Amazon Alexa. If you are a smart speaker technology user as well in your own home, you can set up that flash briefing as well in the Alexa app. Uh, we are also online, obviously, at the miningstockdaily.com. Uh, we have a good archive of previous episodes published, along with um, many of our interviews and corporate updates that uh, we have done uh, throughout the, well, the almost two years now. Um, so I thought before we get started, I wanted to take a little bit of an opportunity to go through a timeline of COVID over the past, well, four months. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I didn't want to do it on a chronological timeline based on COVID. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wanted to provide something that I think most of us on this 
uh, webinar could also really understand and we probably look into more times than we would like to admit, but that would be the gold chart. Uh, so what I did was I took some uh, interesting uh, events uh, regarding COVID uh, and place it on what would be the daily uh, gold futures chart here. Um, and so interesting to know, COVID actually was first reported in December 31st of 2019. Uh, that was something that kind of caught my attention. That's when Chinese authorities alerted the World Health Organization of pneumonia cases in Wuhan city in China with an unknown cause. Uh, that started out as a mystery disease and it was first referred to as the 2019-NCOV, which we all know later became COVID-19. And then we move into the new year, uh, more than a week later, January 9th. That is when China reported its first death linked to the new coronavirus. And it's a 61-year-old male who was admitted to the hospital in Wuhan with several underlying medical conditions. And apart from respiratory failure and severe pneumonia, the patient also suffered from an abdominal tumors and chronic liver disease. So there was uh, more going on than uh, just the virus. But three short days after that, China shared that genetic sequence of the coronavirus with others, helping other countries in testing and tracing any potential effect. Uh, moving on later into January on the 23rd, and I wanted to point this out because this is when I first um, caught the headline here. Uh, actually, uh, I was in Vancouver for the Roundup Conference, and I happened to just leave the convention center for a little bit of time and get away from the hustle and bustle and grab a lunch and the TV was on and they were talking about the coronavirus. I had no idea what they were really talking about because it was just the picture in the TV and I couldn't hear any audio. That's when the city of Wuhan really shut down on January 23rd, all public transportation, closing the airport and, and railways. And then we go into February 2nd here and we can see that that gold trend has a nice upward trajectory right at February 2nd. Uh, that's the first COVID uh, death outside of China, which was reported in the Philippines. The patient was 44 years old, Chinese male, and his known companion, a 38-year-old woman, also tested positive for COVID. So we see a little bit of a dip uh, there, uh, still within range of the current trend. Um, but then we really start moving up. We see a nice uh, upward trajectory in the gold price. Uh, Midway, February 17th, China publishes the paper with detail on COVID-19, and there's a lot of information in there, but it did include that 2% of reported cases of COVID did lead to death. Um, so we see that, uh, we see more countries uh, reporting their first cases of COVID-19. Um, late February, uh, South America reported their first case actually. Uh, and we see this thing really expanding throughout February uh, and lead us into uh, lead us into March here, uh, March 8th, which is another key day, uh, over 100 countries reported cases of COVID-19 and that surpasses 100,000 cases. Uh, that is when things market overall, including gold market also saw a lot of liquidation, uh, fleet to cash, major sell-off, a uh, lot of uncertainty, tons of volatility. Uh, I think we all remember uh, those days pretty, pretty vividly because it was not too long ago. Uh, and this is where things really start escalating in the cases of COVID-19 gain exp uh, uh, exponentially. Uh, on March 11th is when the World Health Organization declared COVID a pandemic. In March 19th, COVID surpasses 200,000 cases globally. And think about this, it took over three months to reach the first 100,000 confirmed cases. And 12 days later, it, it reached the next 100,000. It's totally interesting, but it doesn't stop from there. Five days later, March 24th, 400,000 cases. Four days after that, 600,000 cases. And lead us not about less than a week ago, April 2nd, cases of COVID-19 surpass 
one million. So I, I, I don't know if there's much correlation here between those news events uh, from COVID and the gold price. Obviously, we see a nice upward trend uh, for uh, gold futures contracts here, uh, which is obviously nice to see. But I just thought it'd be interesting to look at the chronological events of uh, COVID and the pandemic crisis we're all living through now and putting it on a gold chart. So you can take that for what you will. I just thought it was kind of interesting uh, to look for. But what does that mean for mining and mineral exploration? Well, I had a nice conversation with Rick Rule. Uh, yesterday on the podcast, and he obviously mentioned that, well, the only thing certain in mining is uncertainty. Uh, so we have a number of things that, that are really hitting uh, the tape for all speculators and precious metals investors right now. Uh, isolation and the lockdown restrictions, we're seeing a lot of operations, uh, producers and exploration projects um, on isolation or lockdown, they can't get to the projects. We're seeing a lot of producers um, close up their operations, temporarily suspending operations. Uh, due to that, there, there's also travel restrictions we've obviously seen worldwide. Um, but because we're closing down operations, many companies are just coming out and saying they're withdrawing guidance um, for, for Q1 and maybe in the rest of the year because they don't know exactly when they'll be able to get back and really ramp up work. Uh, some some uh, mining companies are still operating on a basically a you know a bare you know staff uh, as few people as they can um you know i'm not quite sure if it makes me wonder if uh, that's a good idea or not but i'll leave that up to you uh Thank to you. make your decision because your capital that you're working with uh we're also seeing smelter and refinery suspensions so obviously there is a supply shortage of precious metals. And we're also seeing that in the bullion markets. Uh, physical gold and silver on the retail side is hard to come by right now. There are massive premiums because of it. You can pre-order your coins uh, from the mints if, uh, you, if you really needed to, but those premiums, I'm not quite sure what they are today. Last week, they were about double of what the spot price was. And ultimately, on the this really focuses on the exploration side. Financings are becoming increasingly difficult. Um, I'm hearing many reports of companies who are coming into this quarter uh, Q2 needing to finance before COVID. They had a number uh, in their head that could get them through the remaining of the year. Uh, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of those companies having a hard time financing even uh, half or even a quarter of that from what I'm hearing from uh, people in the industry. Uh, so obviously, volatility is rampant. Uh, not only in precious metals uh, and mining and exploration, but obviously throughout the overall markets. Um, and so uh, my recommendation is always to tread lightly. If you want to put capital in, find uh, de-risk plays specifically on exploration. I recommend looking at companies with plenty of money in the bank that can get them through one year, one and a half. That would be awesome. Uh, great packages. Uh, do they have... Uh, m and i resources uh do they have maybe a million ounces or more in that category that's what i'm looking at uh, i am not being overly aggressive um however i will say that the gold chart looks rather bullish right now and that's about the only bullish chart that i can find <laughs> almost anywhere silver is looking a little bit better but uh, i'm not there yet um all right so that's it for me here's my contact information uh, you can always find me miningstockdaily.com. Twitter is the handle Trev A. Hall, and there is my email address. Happy to take any questions. Uh, and please, I do encourage you to listen into the podcast. Uh, we are actually getting a lot of listeners throughout this market. Uh, uh, each week, we're getting more and more listeners than the week before. Uh, so people are tuning in. Sentiment here looks, uh, are definitely inquiring about precious metals and mining. And uh, you can hit that subscribe button So, and listen in every day. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate, appreciate it. And uh, take care. Stay healthy. And please Stay wash healthy those hands. and please wash those hands. Thank you, Trevor Hall. Um, we're now going to turn to our host. Um, it's a pleasure today to introduce uh, Rudy Frank, who's the co-founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of Seabridge Gold. Rudy's been in the business um, over 35 years in the gold business. 
He was trained as, as a mining engineer at Columbia University. He has broad experience in the mining industry. He's invo been involved in every stage of project development. He started Seabridge in 1999. 20 years is a long commitment. Rudy's been playing the long game. He successfully created the best leverage play to rose, rising gold prices. Seabridge has more gold per common share than any company in the industry. Not to mention that he also has more copper than most copper companies. We've worked with Rudy since 2006. We can attest to the fact that Seabridge's story is always developing. He always has news to report and has never stopped creating value for shareholders. It's a pleasure to turn the call over to Rudy. Uh, thanks, David, and uh, thank you everybody for joining in on the call today. Uh, obviously, during some challenging and very difficult times, um trying to get this uh, technology to work. Just bear with me one minute. Okay, there we go. I assume you can see the first slide now on the screen. I apologize for the delay. Sounds uh, so great, R Rudy. It looks good. You, we can see the uh, corporate, the cover of the slide. Yep, the cover. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. So, just a reminder, I will be making forward-looking statements during today's presentations. Uh, it's hard to be CEO of a gold company without opening your mouth, without making forward-looking statements. So, I do apologize for that. But it's what we believe, what we believe will happen going forward, and the work we will do. Uh, so first question is, well, why gold? Well, uh, we, we've had a thesis now for some time, which is finally really starting to play out here. First and foremost is that the world has far too much debt. Uh, we thought we had a credit crisis in 2008 when global debt was $142 trillion. Fast forward to today, before we even got into COVID, global debt was $257 trillion, an increase of 80% over the past 12 years. And more important, if you look at the level of debt relative to GDP, uh, at the end of Q3 of 2019, it stood at 322%, which is by far a record in the history of the financial markets. Uh, we believe that a recession is now popping the credit bubble. bubble. Uh, we are seeing continuing downgrades. Uh, we expect to see some major defaults as well on the debt, debt market, especially in the high leveraged oil and gas companies. Unemployment is clearly going up. The government deficits are increasing. Uh, in fact, um, uh, Moody's just came out predicting that the, the deficit uh, of 2020 for the for the uh, U.S. fiscal year will exceed two trillion dollars, and perhaps be that again in 2021. Uh, and what are central banks doing? And that's what they continue to try and do to fix every every financial crisis, and that's print more money. Um, the Fed's balance sheet in 2008, stood, uh, stood before 2008, going into the then credit crisis, stood at $800 billion. Uh, based on what they've now promised to the market, it'll grow to about $8 trillion already in, in um, what's been promised. And we would not be surprised to see it to exceed $10 trillion before it's all said and done. As a result of this, uh, we believe that the dollar will fall hard and gold will soar. Uh, we believe that gold will soar not only uh, past uh, previous highs of 1920, but to levels that will shock a lot of people. Uh, I think the smart money is now starting to going into physical gold at least, and will so soon follow into the gold equities. Uh, so for those of you that don't know Seabridge, just a very uh, from a 30,000 foot elevation, we're a company that's known to have a lot of metal in the ground in terms of reserves and resources with a very low share count. Uh, in terms of reserves, proven and probable gold reserves, between KSM Courageous Lake, we have 45 million ounces of gold and over 10 million pounds of copper and nearly 200 million ounces of silver in reserves. Uh, after 20 years, 21 years this coming uh, October, we only have just over 63 million shares outstanding. Today, we're trading at a low valuation at about $13 per reserve ounce uh, and less than uh, $5 per resource ounce. When we formed the company in 1999, our goal was to create what we thought would be the best leverage play to a rise in gold price. Uh, and part of that strategy also was to keep political risk low. 
As a result, all of our assets are located either in Canada or in the United States. Uh, and our big project, KSM, has now gone through the environmental assessment process with permits in hand to cover the first two and a half years of construction. I think what our team has done best, though, is simply finding gold. Over the past 15 years, our exploration team has found more gold, over 100 million ounces of gold in all resource categories, compared to any other gold mining company on the planet. That includes the likes of Newmont, Barrick, Agnigo Eagle, Kinross, and all the majors. What we also tend to do is to take advantage of market bottoms. We formed Steerbridge in 1999 when the price of gold was about 260 an ounce. Uh, over that three-year period to 2002, we went in acquisition mode and, and bought nine deposits. Uh, we replicated that now over the past several years as the gold market got hit hard again uh, from 2015 to 2017. We went out and did two acquisitions, which I'll touch on today briefly as well as just announcing another acquisition just a few weeks ago on our first project in the Yukon. This is a chart that I doubt any CEO of a gold company will show you, and it's the share count relative to the ounce count. When we formed Seabridge, our goal was to create the best leverage play to a rising gold price, and we follow the simple strategy of growing ounces in the ground faster than shares outstanding. We now have a 20-year track record of improving our shareholders' optionality and leverage to gold by offsetting equity dilution with accretion to ounces, simply making sure that the ounce count grows faster than the share count. And what that has translated to over the past 21 years now is significant outperformance relative to the gold price, relative to other gold equities. Uh, in fact, if you look over the past 21 years now, our share price has outperformed the gold price by more than seven to one mean that on average, our share price uh, would go up 70% relative to a gold price increase of about 10%. Um, and then if you look at those periods of time when gold is really on fire, like from 2004 to 2007, when gold moved from $400 to $1,000 an ounce, our share price went from single digits to the high 30s. The financial crisis hit. We got hit with other gold equities, uh, like again this time around with COVID-19. But then coming out of the financial crisis in 2008, our share price again went from, from single digits to the high 30s. Uh, that period of 2011 to 2015 was a tough one, but now what we're seeing is a nice gradual increase in our share price, again, relative to gold, up until, unfortunately, the uh, drop that we've all seen in gold equities as a result of the market sell-off and, um, and, and margin calls, which hit gold stocks pretty hard. So I think the takeaway from this is if you do believe that the gold price is going higher, which clearly we do, Seabridge is not a bad stock to own to take advantage of a rising gold price. Now turning to the assets, uh, our most advanced asset is the KSM asset located in northern British Columbia. It's in the middle of what's known as the Golden Triangle. Uh, we have uh, uh, developed the largest uh, reserve and resource base on the planet in terms of proven and probable gold reserves. In fact, the largest undeveloped gold copper project in the world. Uh, we've also taken this project through the environmental approval process, having received the uh, environmental certificates both federally and provincially in 2014. And we were able to do that not only by having a, a, a properly designed project that safeguards the environment, but also getting the First Nations on side to support the project. We now have impact benefits agreements in place with the Taltan Nation and the Niska Nation and they continue to support us as we move forward. Another big change for us has been the, uh, uh, the building of infrastructure in and around the project. When we bought this project from Placer Dome in June of 2000, there were no roads, no power, and no ports. That has all now been developed over the past uh, several years with other people's money. We now have a major highway, Highway 37, that's maintained by the government running north-south and uh, just to the east of KSM. Matter of fact, our next door neighbor, Predium, has built a road right off of 37 to the doorsteps of KSM, and we do have joint access agreements in place with Predium. Along this road, the governments of British Columbia and uh, the government of Canada has extended the power grid. They invested over $700 million making power available uh, to this part of British Columbia. We've now secured in agreements with BC Hydro 250 megawatts of power from that line that we'll be able to buy for about five cents per kilowatt hour, some of the cheapest power in the world. And last but not least, just to the south of us uh, in the town of Stewart, we now have two new port facilities that will provide year-round access 
uh, to the project to bring supplies in and concentrate out. Access to roads, access to ports, and access to cheap power really does differentiate KSM from other large undeveloped projects around the world. We're also fortunate that we're endowed with a huge resource base. We now have four deposits um, with varying levels of resources and reserves, all of which daylight at the surface. These things crop out. You can actually walk on the top of them. Collectively, between these four deposits, we have seven and a half billion tons of resources containing 106 million ounces of gold and nearly 46 billion pounds of copper. When we went through the environmental assessment process, uh, we've now permitted a tailings capacity facility that can hold about 2.4 billion tons. So although we have 7.5 billion tons of resources, we've been working on varying mine plans over the past few years to come up what is the best mine plan to access these four deposits to drive the best economics on using only 2.4 billion tons of the 7.5 billion tons of resources. Uh, we finished a pre-feasibility study in 2012 that was used as the basis to apply for our permits. We did receive those permits late 2014. We updated our pre-feasibility study in 2016 to show the impact of the project's economics as a result of commitments we made during the environmental assessment process, as well as um, as well as changing metal prices and uh, and exchange rates. That updated study still captured 2.2 billion tons of reserves containing 39 million ounces of gold and just over 10 billion pounds of copper. And the all-in cost of production from this mine plan would have resulted in a total cost per ounce produced of about $670 an ounce, which includes all the upfront capital, the sustaining capital over a 50-year mine life, the closure and reclamation costs, and the operating costs net of byproduct credits. So at a gold price of $1,600, you're looking at a margin of about $1,000 per ounce over the 39 million ounces of reserves. However, what this mine plan did not yet include are the two new zones we've now added subsequent uh, to receiving our permits. Uh, the first addition was the Deep Kerr zone, which was found in 2013 and drilled through 2015 as our third two billion ton deposit uh, at KSM. And then more recently, the, uh, the introduction of the Iron Cap zone. Over the past several years, we've now added over 4 billion tons of material that host over 40 million ounces of gold and nearly 30 billion pounds of copper. So in the updated uh, pre-feasibility study we filed, we also showed an alternate mine plan that essentially took a billion tons of lower grade material from reserve classifications and replaced that with a billion tons of higher grade material from the deep Kerr zone. As a result, we shrunk the size of the open pits we reduced the waste rock that would have to be mined from 3 billion tons down to about 600 million tons, and we improved the, the project's economics. And the improvement of the economics came mostly from capturing more copper. Kerr is a, is a zone that has a higher copper content relative to its gold content. So on the updated mine plan, including deep Kerr, we're still limiting ourselves to the 2.4 billion tons of, of uh, capacity we have permitted. That 2.4 billion tons captured 40 million ounces of gold, but instead of 10 billion pounds of copper, it's now capturing over seven, uh, nearly 17 billion pounds of copper. It'll be a big mine. In fact, it'll be the largest mine ever built in Canada. Uh, our most recent mine plan shows a mine life in excess of 50 years. In the first seven years of mine life, it'll produce over 1.1 million ounces of gold per annum and over 300 million pounds of copper. And if you say to yourself, well, if the project was so good at the pre-feasibility level, why did you do this additional work? It's to further improve the quality of the asset. And as you can see here on this comparison, uh, the 2016 pre-feasibility mine plan, which captures our reserves, versus the 2016 preliminary economic assessment, which captures deep Kerr in the mine plan, you can see a, a significant improvement in the project's economics whereby the total cost of production has dropped by over $300 an ounce from 671 down to 359. And as good as this project is based on this mine plan, we're doing one further iteration, which we expect to have done uh, later in April, that'll incorporate the most recently discovered zone, the iron cap zone, into an updated mine plan. And our expectation is that we will further improve the project's economics above and beyond what we were able to show in the 2016 PEA. 
And why are we confident about that? Well, number one, the iron cap deposit is the deposit that sits closest to the planned infrastructure of the project. The twin tunnel system that'll connect the mine to the mill goes right underneath the iron cap deposit. And within this 2 billion ton deposit we have at iron cap, there's a very high grade zone there as shown in this cross section. Purples and reds are good here. And you can see that that is material that's better than 50 upwards of $100 net smelter return per ton of material. That updated mine plan will be announcing with the, with the uh, uh, related economics uh, by the end of April. We're not a single asset company. I'll run through very briefly, uh, very quickly, the, uh, the four other assets we now have, the most advanced of which is Courageous Lake, a, uh, a, a large property position we have in the Northwest Territories that we bought from New Mountain Total in 2002. Here we've already completed a pre-feasibility study capturing six and a half million ounces of, of reserves. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the economics of that study though, when it was done in 2012, that's the base case on this slide here, you see a project that did not generate very good economic returns relative to the amount of capital that has to go in. However, if you take the same mine plans and, and economics, but change the gold price and change the exchange ratio, you can see a much improved project. Uh, we've now been looking at, is there within this project a smaller, higher grade, more robust startup project? And we continue to work on that and believe that there will be. We've now completed three acquisitions over the past few years. The first of which was the SNP Gold acquisition in June of 2016. We bought SNP Gold, a publicly traded company on the, um, on the venture exchange. We issued 700,000 shares. We did this acquisition because we believe it could be another KSM. In fact, the project already hosts a, an initial resource of 2.2 million ounces of gold, as well as about a half a billion pounds of copper. We've spent the last few years identifying what are the best opportunities to go after in terms of drilling. Um, you can see that from a proximity basis, it's very close to, um, to KSM sharing the same type of geology. Um, we went in with a program last year to, uh, we were vectoring in towards a, uh, what we believe is another porphyry uh, deposit here. Uh, if we're able to drill this year, uh, if we're allowed to open up camps and have um, a drilling program underway, we will drill what we believe will be our first discovery here of a large gold copper porphyry. We've done enough geophysics here, enough mapping and enough uh, drilling to identify that we're in the right zone for that type of deposit. The second acquisition we did recently was a large land package in northern Nevada called Snowstorm. We bought this from uh, John Paulson and company. Uh, we bought this, uh, it does not have a resource on the front end, but it sure has the right address. Uh, Snowstorm sits on the intersection of the Getchell trend, the Nevada Rift trend, and the Carlin trend, uh, which are probably the three most prolific gold belts in Nevada. Our focus has been over the past year or two is to put all the data together that's been generated historically and try to vector in towards a Twin Creeks, Turquoise Ridge, Getchell style uh, system. We did our first drill program last year, which confirmed that we're in the right rocks with the right alteration patterns, with the right structures. And we hope to have a follow-up program later this year uh, to vector closer towards what could be that kind of a discovery. Our most recent acquisition, which was announced on March 30th, is the acquisition of the Three Aces project in the Yukon from Predator Gold. Uh, with three aces, we'll be getting a district scale origin and gold project uh, that has a lot of significant high grade zones already identified. To complete this acquisition, we will pay to Golden Predator 300,000 common shares and issue them a half a percent royalty. We've also agreed that if we have success on exploration going forward, they will make conditional payments totaling 2.25 million Canadian if we find upwards of 5 million ounces of gold. We expect to close this acquisition by the end of May. Uh, here's a, a map on where it's situated in, in southeastern Yukon, uh, road access directly to the project. It's a large land package uh, covering over 350 square kilometers, 35 kilometers of strike length here with known gold showings up and down the entire length, uh, a, a, a year round camp in place there. And if you look historically, uh, Predator Gold has done a good job in terms of showing the uh, the potential of this of this property package. 
Uh, they've drilled a lot of high-grade gold right near surface. Some of these intercepts are eye-popping in terms of how good the grades are with the thicknesses. They've also done a fair bit of, ex of uh, metallurgical testing here. They're able to recover 86 to 95 percent of the gold from the vein material in a gravity circuit. Uh, we don't think the exploration potential here is, is uh, limited to, to high-grade veins. We also have seen a tremendous um, um, evidence of uh, lower-grade halos outside of the veins as well that uh, could make this a bulk mineable situation. Uh, we're excited about this opportunity. Over the next year, we'll be basically pulling all the data together, creating 3D models, doing some surface and mapping, perhaps some geophysics, with the hopes of having our first drill program at Three Aces in 2021. So what drives value to our shareholders going forward? Well, clearly the gold price, if we are now gonna see gold reaching an all-time high, uh, we would expect gold equities to start to catch up to the gold price. Uh, never in my career have I seen gold equities trading as low as they are today relative to the gold price. I might point out that we saw the same thing coming out of 2008 initially, and gold started to move higher, and all of a sudden gold equities went on fire. We expect the same type of outcome here if gold does do what we think it will do. Uh, exploration success. As I mentioned, our team has found more gold than any other gold company on the planet. We now have three new projects to play with, uh, each of which we believe could be a company maker in its own right. And last but not least is completing a joint venture on KSM. Uh, we, uh, we recognize very early on that KSM is too big of a project for a company like Seabridge to try and develop on its own. In fact, we believe there's less than seven companies in the world today that have the financial, technical, and social capabilities to build a project at scale of KSM. Uh, we have been engaged in conversation with most of these companies over the past several years. We have turned down a number of proposals over the past several years. Our goal in a joint venture is to hang on to a meaningful interest in the project while minimizing our capital contribution. We believe that the market is now moving towards us in terms of favor favorable market conditions with higher gold prices, but probably more importantly also with um, a lack of reserves within the major mining companies. And that's not just in the gold mining industry, but also in the copper industry. Uh, we believe that our patients will be rewarded uh, with a deal that I think will, um, uh, will result in a higher share price as, as it's announced. So finally, before we uh, take on questions, uh, we are dual listed. We are part of a number of the uh, major indices, including the GDXJ, low share count, uh, no debt. Um, yeah, we're hearing that raising capital is difficult right now. I will point out that last week, uh, we were able to secure a $14 million financing with one single shareholder of ours who's been involved with us now for almost a decade, uh, putting $14 million into the company in a private placement. Uh, insider ownership in this company, I can't find many companies that have this type of insider ownership. Nearly 40% of the stock is held by insider, with also good uh, institutional ownership as well. So with that, David, I think uh, that's all the talking I need to do, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Rudy. As always, well presented. We'll start with uh, Doug Loud, at the top of the list there. Doug, question today for Rudy. Hey, Rudy. How are you? Doug, I'm well. I owe you a response. I will get back to you in the email you sent me. I apologize. Thank you very much. Um, as you're looking at your various projects, how do you decide which of these new exciting ones to go after? I, I'm sorry, you were a little um, you, uh, garbly there. It was the question which, which one to go after? Well, how do you decide that? And how which do we one decide? Is? For an acquisition? No, no, for these. these Three new projects you have while you continue developing the other ones. Doug, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time here understanding your question. Uh, David, can you repeat it? Maybe you heard it fine. I'm trying to get it. It's a little, um, uh, but he's asking about the where when you find a new, I guess, exciting project that you want to go after, right, uh, Doug? Of the projects you have that are new, the new ones you've just taken on. How do you decide between three aces and say iron cap or or snip well i think uh, you know iron cap was really more on the tail end of what we wanted to do at ksm i think it's probably the last major um, exploration program we will have at ksm uh we think now ksm will be now packaged and ready to go on a joint venture and i think you'll see when we announce the updated technical report for ksm why we did the work and and the results of uh, 
iron cap will definitely improve the project's economics. Uh, and as a result, we believe that in the not too distant future, we'll get a deal done. Obviously, right now in the current environment with COVID-19, maybe not right this second, uh, but clearly, uh, you know, in, in, in the in the intermediate term, we would expect to have a deal done. And then it's what's next. And we are fortunate that for what's next, we now have four great projects. We have Courageous, yeah. we have Courageous Lake that is already uh, over 10 million ounces of known resources on a greenstone belt that's uh, six, uh, 50 kilometers long. We've only fully explored about two kilometers of that belt. We have a project uh, that sits just north of two of the best mines in existence right now, Twin Creeks and Getchell, near infrastructure of a major mining company. So any kind of a discovery there will be well received in the market and probably pretty easy to move forward in terms of a transaction with our neighbors. Um, Iskit could be another KSM. Uh, we're excited about that. It's a big, big system. Uh, you remember when we bought KSM from Placer Dome, there was only 3 million ounces of gold there at the time of acquisition and 2 billion pounds of copper. Today, we have over 100 million ounces of gold and uh, over 45 billion pounds of copper. If this kid is anything close to KSM, obviously, it's another company maker in its own right. And then last but not least here, we have, uh, we have our most recent one, Three Aces. Three Aces is a project we've been following now for several years. Um, yeah. I've, known Bill, I've known Bill Shera for well over 20 years. Uh, the work that Golden Predator has done on this asset has been phenomenal, uh, you know, identifying the potential here. It's a project that, quite honestly, is fits better into Seabridge than it would be with Golden Predator. I mean, it's a project that's going to take, you know, 20 to $30 million of work over the next several years to really do it justice. And uh, Predator Gold did not have the ability to raise those kind of dollars in the current market while they focus on their more advanced Brewery Creek asset. So, um, you know, in, in, our, in our case, um, you know, we sit down every year as our team. We look at what the opportunities are. We come up with our objectives for the upcoming year. We put the funding in place to achieve those objectives. And uh, it's a year by year basis. Uh, best project wins. Uh, this year, we were planning two drilling programs at Snowstorm and Iskit. We hope we can carry those out. Uh, that'll be a function of whether we can get our, not only our teams into the field, but also the contractors that provide the drills and the, and the, and the, uh, and the drilling personnel. Uh, and then we'll look again at the end of this year, what we learn and what we may do next year. Great, that, that's very helpful, thank you. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Doug. We're gonna to turn to John Burke. John, question today for Rudy. Hi, Rudy, how are you? I'm well, John, yourself? Oh, pretty good. Good. Thank you. Uh, Rudy, are you limited in what you can say about Golden Predator since it's not finished yet? Or? No, I, I don't think so. Uh, okay. why, what's your question? My well, question, as a as a stockholder, congratulations uh, to be able to buy that for less than a, a daily, your daily volume is rather amazing, I think. Uh, the That that property seems to lend itself to its issue of uh, uh, mining. Are you planning anything along those lines? In terms of the bulk sampling mining he did there? Yeah. Uh -huh. No, I, I don't think so. I, I think uh, that was really more of a way to generate revenue for Predator Gold in the tough market environment versus going out and issuing shares. But from our perspective, having bulk sample results like he has there showing tremendous recoveries on, on material that, ounce, that averaged almost an ounce per ton right at the surface, not many projects I've stepped into in my career have that on the front end already identified. So we're excited that that work was done. We're glad it was done, but that won't be our focus. Our focus here will be looking at what is the potential of the district we now have there. You know, 30 kilometers of strike length is a lot of exploration to put your head around. We don't need to be doing, uh, you know, bulk samples and small mining plants there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, John. Great question. We'll turn to Lincoln. Lincoln Rathman. Lincoln. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm always impressed with your presentations. It seems this KSM seems so enormous. I was I was wondering if you could give it, uh, put it in context to other projects in the world. You know, you mentioned you had 45 million ounces of gold and 20 billion pounds of copper. Would this make it like Grassberg or Gold Strike or one of these other? Uh, Big projects? Yeah, it, it, it's the scale of a Grassberg. Uh, it's the scale of a Batuhiju. If you remember when uh, both of those projects were first uh, capitalized, I think the uh, 
the reserves they had in place at the time was 2 billion tons. And obviously beyond that, it grew quite uh, dramatically. So in terms of scale, it is the same. Uh, it's probably um, not as good grade as Grassberg. Very few projects are. But then again, it's also not in Indonesia, which I'm happy with because uh, yes. <laughs> it's not a jurisdiction I would want to play in. I think if you look at today in the world today, you know, in safe jurisdictions, what are the what are the other projects out there of this type of scale? I mean, you know, on this slide here, on this slide here, I, I identify Nova Gold. Nova Gold is an exceptionally run company, good management team in place. Uh, they have half of the Donlan Creek asset in Alaska that is in joint venture with Barrick. Um, half of that asset is um, is about 17 or 18 million ounces of reserves to Nova Gold's credit. Um, it's an asset that still is not permitted. It's an asset that um, has higher capital than KSM has and will have higher operating costs as well. But it's a world-class asset in a good jurisdiction that trades at a significant valuation premium to Seabridge today, uh, not because of the asset, I think more because they already have a joint venture partner in place, which gets comfort to the market. Uh, another similar scale asset to what you know we have or what Nova Gold has with copper would be a Northern Dynasty's Pebble Project in Alaska, uh, which obviously has been challenged over the years in terms of permitting challenges. Uh, maybe they get it done, but I think there's still a lot of hoops they need to jump through to get that project permitted. Uh, but again, a scale project that that is far and few in the world. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the world that I would look at in terms of, uh, you know, what projects we may be competing with in the market to the to the major mining companies. Hmm. Well, you know, your stock has done relatively well, but would seem depressed in relation to your assets. Uh, is, is, the, is, it, is it the CapEx challenge that is uh, that's holding it back? I, I don't think so. I think CapEx, you know, you look at what these big companies are generating cash flow right now in, in the current market. Uh, they, they can fund a project like this, you know, $5 billion sounds like a big number, but recognize that's over to a four to five year uh, mine construction period, uh, of which probably half of that capital can be raised using the copper or the concentrate as a pre-production uh, uh, financing uh, to a smelting company that's probably willing to provide at least half of the capital up front to lock into a copper concentrate feed for more than 50 years. I think the big challenge for us over the past few years is that, you know, we all hit the top in 2010, 2011. The bigger companies at that top, they actually um, did some very expensive acquisitions that resulted in them taking on a lot of debt. As the market went against them, both in terms of the gold price and the copper price, they were forced to sell non-core assets during that time. They were not taking on new projects and they were using the sale proceeds from non-core assets to pay down debt. Uh, I, over the past couple of years, though, uh, I can tell you firsthand that these big companies that were not very inquisitive during that downturn as they were dealing with their large uh, debt issues are now focused more on opportunities like this. Uh, we've gotten close a few times on deal terms, uh, not quite there yet. Uh, you know, we're fortunate that we have a shareholder base that's very patient, that understands what we have. The gold and the copper in the ground is not going away. It's there. In fact, we keep growing it. We'll have an updated resource estimate out uh, for KSM uh, later this month that'll show a further increase even above and beyond what we report here today. Um, I think our patience will be rewarded. But I think, I think now is the time for the big companies to start to focus on what comes next for them. Because if you look at the gold industry, uh, you know, most of the senior gold companies, they have maybe 10 years of reserve life left. They've got debt instruments that go out 20 years. They need to find new projects or new reserves that they can mine over the next 10 to 20 years. They don't have that internally right now. Either they have to find it themselves, which they're not very good at. I think if you look at the track record of discoveries of the major mining companies, uh, the discoveries are made by companies like Seabridge. Um, uh, so they need to go out and, and, and find new opportunities to, to get into to extend my life and uh, and replace reserves they mine every year. Thank you. You're That's welcome. Helpful. Thank you, Lincoln. Uh, we'll turn to uh, Murray Vanderbilt. Murray, question today for Rudy.
Murray, can you hear us? You're on mute. I'm sorry, you're not hearing me? We can now, Murray. Oh, sorry. Rudy, um, good to talk to you again. I'm wondering how candid you could be. If I, if I were talking to the chairman of the big guys that might be looking at you, and I know you've actually been talking to them for 10 to 15 years. Um, well, not quite that long, but a long time, you're right. <laughs> Well, it seems like I've been there for 10 to 15, but um, what would they be saying now? Yeah, we like it, but not yet. Or, you know, we need the price of gold to hold above 1500 for a couple of years. So our cash, you know, we improve our balance sheets enough to stick up or uh, you're number two on our list. Can you be a little bit more candid of when you get close of wh why they back off? Or put it off. Is it is it at price or their their problem not to finance it or not feel comfortable taking on something this size yet? I think it comes down to terms. Uh, you know, we have a very clear vision in terms of the deal structure we want to have here, in terms of what retained interest we want on the project relative to how much capital we're willing to spend against the five billion dollars, and uh, we just haven't met on those terms yet. Uh, I think I think in terms of structure, I think what the majors like about the structure we're proposing, it's it's not money into our shareholders' pockets, it's money into the ground to the advance of the project to a construction decision. You know, we kind of look at it as perhaps a three-phased earn-in by our partner. The first phase would be sole funding on their side to complete bankable feasibility. The next phase would be site capture and start a construction. And then the third and final phase would be, you know, continuing to sole fund to get to a, a majority interest in the project. Um, and then the question is, what percentage do we keep at the end of the day relative to how much capital do we need to put up? Uh, we would expect our partners to come up with a, a good chunk of capital over the three phases, sole funding. During that time, go out and raise 50% of the project's requirements through some sort of project facility. That's non-recourse to Seabridge, but recourse to the project. Uh, and then we would like to see our funding for the project, whatever percentage is left to fund based on our working interest to come in towards the end of mine construction. There's a lot of moving parts in that type of deal structure, clearly. We're talking about a lot of dollars over uh, you know, the, the period of the earn-in. And I guess it's just we just haven't reached the terms that we can say yes to yet. But I think in terms of the structure, they like the structure. Because if you look at the uh, their past, their past, dealings at the top of the market in 2010, 2011, they went out and bought companies and paid large premiums for those companies and either issued shares, you know, blowing up their share count or in a lot of cases took on debt for those acquisitions. And then the market went against them. The mines never got built, but they were still sitting there with all this debt. Uh, the problem from my perspective at that point in time is they should have put the money into the projects not into the pockets of the shareholders of the companies they were buying. We're not asking to be bought here. In fact, we think our shareholders do better in a joint venture structure on that type of um, structure than we would if we looked to sell the company here at you know a traditional 30 or 40% premium. I did not spend 21 years of my life to build the asset base to where we are today and sell this company for you know today's share price plus a 30 or 40% premium. We believe that in a joint venture with a major mining company on the right terms will result in a major significant move in our share price. And if you want to look at what that could be, just look at Nova Gold's valuation relative to ours on any metric. Um, we'd, no, love their, we'd love their valuation after a joint venture is announced. I'm, I'm with you there. Uh, so just uh, the other thing, and you just touched on it, but you know, my my thought, and I think yours expressed a couple of years ago, I think when you did the snowstorm, you know, the KSM is a bit of a waiting game. And, and certainly with the, the price of gold holding up and, and when copper finally kicks in, and as you say, the reserves for these other large companies keep coming down and down and down, you know, eventually they'll get there. But I thought snowstorm, Courageous Lake was... In my mind, something that if you could sell it, you would have sold it quickly at the right price. But um, Snowstorm and now Three Aces, it's for you to be doing something else while the waiting game goes on. And can you be a little more specific about where the your your timeline for and 
the, the, those four projects of developing them or the cash you're going to put in there, if, what we can expect to see in the next year or two if we have to wait two years for KSM to unfold or a deal to be announced? Yeah, so we, we have budgets this year for uh, Iskid of about $6 million Canadian and Snowstorm about $4 million Canadian on drill programs we'd like to put in place. Um, we hope we can do those programs right now. I think it's still a question whether we can. We'll know better, I think, towards the end of May, whether we'll be able to open up camps and bring the drilling contractors in. So if you kind of look at us over the last several years, our spend, including KSM, has been, as a company, you know, 25 to $30 million a year. Uh, I, I think that's a reasonable level going forward based on the assets we now have. Probably less of a spend on KSM because I think we're now at a point where we've done all the, um, uh, we picked the easy fruit there. Um, we've de-risked the asset through permitting. Uh, we've continued to make it better through additions of resources at better grades than our reserves. So I think the focus will turn to the other assets. Uh, and I think you know any one of the four other assets we have could be company makers in their own right. Let's not forget that before we did any work at KSM, Courageous Lake on its own generated a market cap of a half a billion dollars to our shareholders back in 2000 and, um, and uh, 2006, I believe it was. So uh, these, these assets, uh, when in the right market, can generate value. You know, if, I, if I'm thinking longer term in terms of, um, you know, how do we unlock value beyond a deal at KSM? You know, what, what, one, one possibility is um, when KSM is joint ventured with the right partner and we're starting to get the value of what we should be getting in our share price, think about all the other companies out there that might be interested in owning our share of what's left of KSM with limited capital to spend on it, a meaningful interest in the project, and an operator in place. I would not rule out, you know, at the right time, a sale of the company at a premium to market at a higher share price with then the vend out of our other assets back to our shareholders in Seabridge too. Uh, that might be uh, you know, a, a road we go down. We have looked over the years in terms of selling assets outright here. Unfortunately, uh, the way as a Canadian company, the way Revenue Canada deems value is they wouldn't determine what your tax base would be until a year or two later based on the then value of that asset that was spun out, uh, which could mean a big tax bill for us going forward. The better way to spin out assets as part of a, a, an amalgamation or a sale process to a bigger company and then spinning them out on a tax-free rollover to our shareholders. Um, but we are always thinking about ways to create value going forward and there's lots of ideas that have been germinating and, um, and we discuss on a regular basis. Interesting new insights. Thank you. You're Thanks for being on the call, Murray. We'll turn to Michael Potter. Michael, question for Rudy today. Hi Rudy, very interesting talk. Um, that 14 million that's just been raised is to, as I understand it, is to cover um, the potential tax bill. Can you give us some more um, data on that? Happy to do that. It's been overhanging our stock now for over a year and I think finally it's now behind us. So as a Canadian company with a Canadian asset, we've been successful raising a lot of our exploration dollars through flow through mechanisms, where we're able to sell shares at least at a 30% premium to market. We then turn around and use those proceeds and invest that into, into specifically our KSM asset. Uh, we then go to the government to show what we spend every year that, that fall into that uh, Canadian exploration expenditure bucket. Uh, we've been audited many times by the CRA on that, uh, and more. And just just last year, they after auditing us for three years, they came back and said they don't agree with some of our expenditures that we allocated as a Canadian exploration expenditures, and told us that they um, uh, that we will get a tax bill ourselves plus the individual investors that we indemnified on the front end, totaling about fourteen million dollars Canadian. That was a year ago when we first made that public disclosure. Uh, I was shocked on how the market reacted to it. The next three days of trading after we released our 2018 financial statements, we lost $200 million of market cap on a potential $14 million liability. Subsequent to that, we went back to the Canadian Revenue Authority, showed them where they were wrong in terms of their assessments and their calculations. 
After a year of haggling back and forth, they agreed on a minor reduction to what the tax bill would be. And we received a uh, our tax reassessment from the Seabird side of $2.1 million uh, two weeks ago. We announced that in our year and financial statements, as well as our expectation that now that we've been reassessed, we also expect the individual investors that finance this company uh, that they'll be reassessed for the tune of $11.8 million. Uh, we decided that since we have indemnification and an obligation to these investors to make them a hold on any tax reassessment, uh, the best way to handle that is to actually deposit the funds with the CRA on their behalf and our behalf and continue to battle now outside of CRA in tax court. Our advisors, uh, our tax advisors and our auditors believe that we're in very solid ground with our argument. In fact, the CRA audited us three years before this period that they challenged us on with the same type of expenditures and signed off on them as valid. Um, we intend to battle this, uh, but in the meantime, we decided to uh, let's bite the bullet, let's put the funds aside, let's get this as, a, as an issue that doesn't need to be dealt with in the future in the marketplace. Uh, worst case scenario, the money is already with the CRA. Uh, best case scenario which we'll get to is that the money will come back to us when we win on this with accrued interest. Okay, thanks a lot for clearing that up. Cheers. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for being on the call, Michael. We've got John Bowen with us. John, question today for Rudy? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. You're constrained by the two uh, billion uh, tons of um, uh, on the permitting. Um, is there an assumption that by you and your prospective partners that uh, once this KS ends up and running, that that permitting gets revisited and the uh, lower grade material gets brought in again? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, John. And you know, it's not just the our potential partners; it's the First Nations. You know, we're showing a 50-year mine life now. They come to us and say, "Hey." you're only capturing a third of your resources 50 years. We want to see a mine life that goes beyond 100 years. How can we help you? Well, by having big open pits that are mined and having perhaps big block caves, those are great holes in the ground that you can put more tailings. So, and as the partners look at this, we recognize, yeah, we, we cap we'll capture 2.4 billion tons under what's permitted, but later on into the project, we'll look at increasing the, um, the amount of material that can be mined by using open pits and uh, perhaps block caves as places to store additional tailings to give us more capacity. Matter of fact, some of the big copper companies come in and look at this and say 170,000 tons a day, you're mining a third of your resource in 50 years. If you mined it all, it's 150 years. How do we make this mine bigger? I think if you look at you know mines that have been built by some of these big copper guys, um, you know they start at 120 to 140,000 tons a day. But uh, you know the right capacity for KSM is probably 300 to 400,000 tons a day, and even with that, with our existing resources, you'll have a mine life well in excess of 50 years. So yes, it's something we've thought about. Yes, it's something we've talked not only with our potential partners about, but more importantly with the indigenous people that will need their support on when it's time to go after those additional tons to get permitted. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks. You're welcome. Thanks, John. Uh, we'll turn to Ryan Deeth. Ryan, question for Rudy. Ryan, you're unmuted. Can you hear us? Uh, David, I just want to interject here. Ryan did type in his question. Uh, if he can't unmute, uh, I can read it. That would be great. Uh, what is the total cast? cash position and can you talk about the burn rate dilution <laughs> sure happy to do so yeah we, we try to maintain about 20 million dollars of working capital on a balance sheet at all times we are fortunate that we have an atm in place uh, that in in the first quarter of this year i think we drew down 6.7 million dollars with very little impact on the market actually there's no impact we're very delicate with our shares uh, and we try to maintain that through the ATM as well as other funding mechanisms we put in place. For example, in a very challenging time in the markets, we were able to go out and raise $14 million without having to pay a single dollar in commission and all of it raised from one shareholder. Uh, we try to end each year with somewhere between 15 to $20 million in the treasury. 
We then lay out our budgets for the upcoming year, which can go anywhere from, we've had budgets over the past decade, anywhere from $20 million a year to $50 million when we're in full scale permitting. And then we fund that as needed each and every year. We've never gone out and just say, let's put a big chunk of capital on our balance sheet. We can do that. We turn down block deal proposals on a regular basis. Uh, but our view is uh, we're not going to have a, we're not going to raise money till we have a use of proceeds that we believe can drive shareholder value and more importantly, grow ounces on a per share basis. So uh, that's how we manage our, our capital structure. I think, you know, the, the thing that I'm most proud about, about being the CEO of this company over 21 years now, is after 21 years, we only have 63 million shares outstanding. To think that we've been able to accomplish that while amassing a resource base and a reserve base like we have, there's no one in the industry that comes close to that in terms of capital efficiency, in terms of, you know, using your shares to raise dollars that needed and offsetting that dilution with, with accretion to ounces or value and uh, keeping the share count relatively low. Yeah, you know, I'm often asked, uh, you know, when they look at our capital structure, when did you do your rollback? Well, we've never done a rollback. Uh, when we took over the shell in October of 1999, there already was 17 million shares outstanding. We've now grown it to 63 million shares, but we've added 122 million ounces of gold resources, 46 billion pounds of copper, and nearly 600 million ounces of silver while suffering that dilution. Oh, and we got the project permitted too. David, I did want to point out too that I think we have Marshall Barrel on the line. Okay, we can go to Marshall next. Yes, can you hear me? We can, Marshall. Good. Uh, hi, Rudy. Uh, th thanks for the update and the continued work. Um, you mentioned uh, because of uh, COVID-19, your discussions with potential JV partners uh, is, I guess, kind of on hold now, and it may be for the intermediate or looking out to the intermediate term, I'm wondering how you would define intermediate term. <laughs> when, when, when does the world open up again, Marshall? You know, Marshall, you and I, I think my last face-to-face -face meeting with the shareholder was you and I sitting down in San Francisco only about three weeks ago. <laughs> it was my last face-to-face -face meeting with practically anybody except my wife and the uh, grocer. <laughs> Good thing is you and I both survived, and uh, we've now self-quarantined for 14 days. Um, Amen. I, I, I don't know, Marshall. It, it's a tough question. You know, we we we're still engaged. We're still we're still doing. Uh, you know, answering technical questions on a daily basis with firms that are still in the data room. You know, when 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 will a corporate development team be able to go to the board and say, okay, we now want to do this project? Uh, in the face of what's going on with their own projects and their own capital uh, budgets internally and their own minds that are looking at what's the impact of COVID-19 on their operations, on their people. You know, I, I think, you know, unfortunately, I think we're going to have to wait till we get back to, to, to normal again. Um, when is that no. going to be? I, I hope soon, but I think, I think the market right now is pricing in too quick of a recovery. I think this thing is going to take a bit more time than what the uh, the markets may be telling you now in terms of uh, the bounce off the bottom we've seen. Well, I I think you're right there generally, although I'm I'm optimistic about uh, gold uh, in in that regard that it starts to people start to realize they better own some gold in one form or another. Um, no, that that's helpful that you say there are still discussions going on and. And uh, working from home is it works for getting information back and forth. So that's that that's helpful to know. Uh, and then I think you said with regards to what you would like to do in 2020 on the well the three newer projects. Uh, that's going to depend on uh, what happens uh, over the next month or two. And if you, if if things are have some clarity by the end of May. Can you do a lot of the work that you would hope to do in 2020 on those uh, three projects or, or maybe uh, two, uh, maybe three aces won't be ready yet, but uh, would you be able to do most of it if you can have some uh, uh, reasonable clarity by the end of May for the things you want to do in 2020 on its gut and stuff? Yeah, that, that's our hope. Uh, you know, we have constant dialogue with the contractors that we've engaged for those programs. 
Uh, they would like to get the work done, obviously, because right now they're not doing anything. Um, so if we can open up the camps and bring the contractors in and, and run the programs in a safe manner, we will do that. But again, it's, uh, you know, at this point in time, I don't know. I wish I did. I wish I could be more certain. But the fact is, none of us know that. Sure, sure. Okay, and my last question is, I don't think I saw, and maybe it wasn't announced, who uh, the uh, the $14 million placement went to. And also, is that share price, is that Canadian or U.S.? <laughs> I, w I wish it was U.S. I can't see anyone paying a premium to market uh, to settle a tax bill. <laughs> no, it, it was Canadian, Marshall. And uh, we have not disclosed who that single shareholder is. Um, uh, they will disclose it when they do their next 13D filing, I would assume. Okay, but it is an existing shareholder. You didn't add somebody. No, it's an existing shareholder. Okay. Well, <clears throat> be safe, uh, uh, and uh, we'll certainly wait developments on the outside world and, and with Seabridge. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Marshall. Take care. Thanks, Marshall. We always appreciate your participation. Let's turn to Stratos Manolis. We'll get Stratos's question and then we'll proceed to close. Stratos? Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I do have a question uh, regarding the potential uh, joint venture partner. Uh, Rudy, you mentioned many times in the past, and you imply today as well, that a copper company is more likely to be the partner than a gold company. Uh, at the moment, the price of copper is very low, and if we go to recession, uh, these copper companies might have much less profits, and some of them might be uneconomic, some of the projects are uneconomic even to produce it. We don't know how far this is going to be, we don't know if it's going to happen. Do you think if still is the case that the copper companies were more likely partner, that uh, this situation uh, might delay things for a potential deal? Always a possibility. That I will tell you the copper companies we're talking with, uh, they view the current copper price as, as an anomaly. That, uh, you know, at some point when the world does open up again, uh, the copper market is undersupplied right now, and it's only going to be more undersupplied over the next uh, three to 10 years. So when they look at this opportunity, they're not using today's copper price of 225 or whatever it is. They're looking at this in the context of what their expectation would be when this mine was up and running. Um, and let's not also, you know, and, you know, I, we would not be surprised. We've talked about this as well, is that our deal may not be with just a single company, uh, a copper company or a gold company, or perhaps even a gold company and a copper company working together may want to bring a financial partner in on the front end to answer those tough questions they will get from their shareholders in terms of why are you doing a $5 billion project now? I think if they're able to bring in a financial partner on the front end as part of a syndicate, that probably makes it more palatable to them and their shareholders in the context of the current market. So let's not rule that possibility out. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the update. Hey, thanks, Stratos. Thank, thank you, Stratos. Okay, Rudy, I think we'll turn, uh, turn it back to you for closing remarks. It's been a very informative call. Okay, well, again, I want to thank everybody for uh, taking the time uh, to pay attention to this call. Looking at the numbers, I think it may have been the highest attendance we ever had for one of these it towns. It was, really. It was, indeed. Um, you know, I, let's, all I can say is be safe, be smart. We will get through this. We will come out of the other end and, uh, you know, just uh, continue to do the right thing. Uh, you know, I, uh, our, part, our, part, our prayers go out to everybody here in a very, very difficult and challenging time. And thank you again. And um, if you have any follow-up questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, send me an email. My email address is rudy at seabridgegold.net. That's R-U-D-I at seabridgegold.net. And David, thanks again. Uh, you know, we've been uh, working with you now for well over a decade. And uh, the work you do for us uh, continues to be first rate. And we really appreciate you sticking with us for as long as you have. So, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rudy, very much. And thank you, everyone, for your attendance today. Wish you a pleasant evening and safety. Help, good health. Bye.